Hello, and welcome to the Sex Within Marriage podcast. My name is JD. I am a Christian marriage coach, and I blog over at uncoveringintimacy.com as well. And today's episode, we're going to be answering a whole bunch of questions that we got from our anonymous have a question page on our blog, on our website. And for those who don't know, we have a page up there. You can ask a questions anonymously. I don't have a way to trace it back to you. It also means I don't have a way to ask for any more uh, context or ask follow-up questions or anything. And basically, you have to wait till I get around to answering them publicly. And unfortunately, lately, it's been quite busy with all the coronavirus and everything. I have been, frankly, swamped while everyone else is kind of shutting down. I've been getting a lot of query requests from people to help them, uh, mostly with their technology stuff, because I'm a software engineer by trade, and that's my day job. So I've been spending a lot of my time uh, both at work and uh, also my volunteer time helping people move from kind of normal in-house things to uh, something that I heard the other week. Uh, They called it pots and pans. And anyone in the telecom system knows that uh, POTS is an acronym for plain old telephone system. And But PANS was a new one for me. Uh, that was an acronym for pretty awesome new services. So yeah, I've been spending a lot of time helping people move to POTS and PANS, which, is, which has been a lot of fun, but it hasn't given me a lot of free time, unfortunately. But now things are starting to slow down. I have a bit of breathing room. And uh, so I thought I'd get this podcast out while I can. Also, I have a few other things uh, coming up that I'll tell you about at the end of the podcast. But for now, uh, let's just jump straight to the questions. So as I said, these questions come from our anonymous have a question page. I'll link to it in the show notes if you have a question of your own. Or you can just email me at j at uncoveringintimacy.com. And that way I can ask questions back and we can actually work on it a little bit more than just giving an answer without any context. But for those who prefer to remain anonymous and use the forum, uh, these questions also get posted in our supporters forum, and uh, we all discuss it in there. So my answers are part my own answers. They're uh, part discussions that I have with my wife, and a lot of the input also comes from our supporters because they get to see the questions immediately when they pop up, and some of these have very long, protracted conversations with a lot of depth to them. I'm trying to pull out kind of key features and answer them. Uh, as best as I can while keeping it short. But if you want to be part of the larger discussion, uh, if you want to see the kind of the full picture of what people think, then uh, maybe check out our support page. And there's a link to the show, show notes for that as well. So the first question somebody submitted was, is it wrong to add a gangbang to my bucket list? So, uh, for those who don't know, a gangbang is when a woman has sex with multiple men at the same time. And yeah, it's absolutely wrong. It's adultery, plain and simple. Even if your spouse is okay with it, that doesn't make it okay. Uh, and if you want more, have questions about that idea, uh, you can check out the post uh, on my site that's called, is, Dal- is it still adultery if you have permission, uh, where I go into a lot more depth about that idea. And I'd even argue that fantasizing about it is wrong because when we give sin a foothold in our mind, we tend to start to rationalize it and then justify it. And soon you'll start to think that maybe it's not so wrong and maybe you'll try to make it a reality. And uh, my wife had an interesting idea, thought too. She said uh, that maybe you should ask yourself what it is about this activity that you're drawn to. I think that's a really good point. You know, rather than dwelling on the fantasy itself, it might be helpful to dig into the why of it. You know, what about it is appealing? For example, it might be the idea of having so much attention put on you. And maybe it's about having multiple erogenous zones pleasured at once or the feeling, uh, you know, that have that desire to feel overwhelmed. Uh, Maybe it's wanting to be seen as sexually desirous. And whatever the reason is, maybe there are things in your own marriage that you can change to kind of meet these desires in another way, in a way that's uh, honoring both to God and to your spouse and is healthy for your marriage. All right, next question is, my husband and I are still in the newlywed phase of marriage and have been loving your blog and resources that we, as we've been figuring out how to thrive together and have a healthy sex life in our marriage. We particularly found the post on spontaneous and responsive desire and have had great conversations about it since it named what we've been experiencing. I normally don't want to start in on sex, but once one of us orgasms, I really enjoy it. I was wondering, as someone with a responsive desire, how do I continue to build a thriving sex life and have an equal give and take with my husband without feeling like I'm having sex out of obligation to him while we're in the foreplay stage? Um, 
the short answer is you you don't um i don't think you should aim for an equal give and take take uh, people who aim for equal in their marriage uh, usually end up basing their marriages on conditional love rather than unconditional love. You start worrying about who is giving more, and since it will never be perfectly evil uh, because we tend to overwhel- overvalue our own giving and our spouse's taking, um, you're kind of setting yourself for looking for an imbalance to be unhappy about. Instead, I would say that you should just focus on the giving part from your side. You know, give what you can, when you can, as often as you can. Um, That goes for sex or anything else. And that way you can have a thriving sex life, a thriving marriage, really, without worrying about who is initiating more, who is enjoying it more, about who is having more orgasms, or who is in the mood more often, or who responds better. You know, comparisons like that really do you no good. So as someone with responsive desire... I would say simply focus on what you can do. You can choose to respond even when you don't feel in the mood, knowing that you will get there. You can choose to initiate even when you aren't feeling that desire at the moment, simply because you know it will bless your spouse. And you can choose to try new things, even suggest them, because it will be important to your spouse, even if it's not important to you. But by choosing to love, it also takes out the obligation factor of it. You know, it's not something you have to do. It's something that you choose to do. You decide to do out of love, out of unconditional love, not because they're holding up their end of the bargain or because it's an equal give and take, but simply because you want to love them. You know, my wife said, you know, it's it's not easy to adopt this mentality, and she says she still struggles with it. And the idea is, what can I do and how much can I give? You know, but when you remember that marriage is 100% from both people, not 50-50, it helps keep that perspective of giving because uh, you love, not because you feel obligated. And, you know, I don't think adopting it necessarily means that you will never struggle with this. We all tend to fall back on old, old patterns when we get emotionally flooded. It's definitely a process, and it's something that you'll likely never completely master. But even if you make small improvements, you can see large differences. So in short, don't try to be equal. Don't try to have a give and take. Just try to give. And uh, hopefully you've married someone that also has that same mindset that they just want to give because they love you and they love seeing you receive that giving. Uh, Whether that's initiating or whether that's saying, hey, let's just watch TV tonight and not have sex. But I'm glad you found the blog and our podcast and you're you know, starting your marriage off at a good point. You know, I, I get a lot of emails from people that they don't find us until 10, 15, some 30, sometimes more years into their marriage. And I always get these emails saying, you know, I wish we had started on this earlier. I wish we had learned these things. I wish somebody had taught us this. So the fact that you're newlyweds and you're thinking forward about how to avoid this, that really puts you in a good position starting out. So good for you. I'm proud of you. All right. Question three uh, says, hey there, Jay, quick question for you. Uh, Just as a side note, anytime someone says quick question for you, they're never quick. Uh, I don't know why. They always tend to be the long ones. Anyways, it continues. So my wife and I are currently trying to revitalize our sex life. It hasn't been great for the past few years, but we know it needs to, but we know it needs to be better. We've started scheduling sex, talking about it more op- openly, looking for ways to mix it up here and there. The problem we run into is that we're getting, if we're getting going, sometimes one little thing can really throw off the whole thing off. Here's an example. Let's say we've been making out for five minutes. It's great and fun and we're getting warmed up, but suddenly either it's been too long, too short, or maybe my wife just isn't ready yet. So she starts to pull back a bit. I push on, but notice her pulling back. She's in her head about it, so I start to get anxious and fidgety, and I'll ask, what's wrong? Which I know is not what I need to ask because it makes her think that there should be something wrong. And yet, I do it because I can't think of literally anything else to say. Then she gets even more flustered, and about five minutes, in about five minutes, we're both upset, and sex clearly isn't happening that night, and maybe not for another month. My question is, do you have any advice on how to get over that hump? I get this mental block, like I'm not able to think of what to do to fix it. And she's so in her head that we get stuck. This doesn't happen every time, but it does happen enough to cause a problem. We're both always worried, will this be another bad time? 
Any advice on how to get over that? I know the obvious answer is repetition and to create more good than bad times, but I was wondering if you had any practical advice. Maybe some things that we can change up. Okay, so I think more importantly than how to get over the hump is why is this hump here? Or whether why is it hanging you up? I would say ideally when she pulls back, you two should be able to pause, have a conversation about what's going on, what she needs, what you need, and then see if you can make it happen. Uh, Maybe it's been going on too long, uh, like the foreplay, and that's fine. She can suggest moving on to something else. Maybe it's too short, and that's okay too. She can ask for more. Or maybe she's just not enjoying what you're doing. That's also not a problem. Often what worked last time won't work this time, so switch to something else. Or just take a rain check for tomorrow. The point is, you need to communicate about this, and the reason you're having a hump is because something is coming up, but it sounds like no one's talking about it. Uh, You're just pulling back and then getting stuck because you don't know what to do. And so you can't navigate around it. You're just trying to push past the conflict, and that's why you're getting hung up on it. So my practical advice is talk about it. And it's awkward at first and uncomfortable, but it, like you said, it helps and it gets better. And my wife said, you know, that, you know, if she's feeling either bored or not ready to move on to the next activity or whatever is going on, uh, she said, you might try engaging her brain with what's happening with her body, you know, engage all the senses, you know, for my wife, she has ADHD and she says her mind wanders a lot and it's hard sometimes to stay in the moment and she gets stuck in her head, uh, And one thing that's helped us, uh, she says, is that I start kind of telling her a story of something that we might do during sex or adding uh, dirty talk and of things that I want to do to her. And that helps her get her brain engaged with where we want to go and not get yeah just hung up in her mind. And if that idea kind of scares you a bit, uh, I wrote kind of an introduction to dirty talk, which I'll link to in the show notes as well. Uh, I'm also curious, I'm really curious, why is it sometimes that it will take a month before you have sex again? Like what, what is happening that you or she are not initiating for a full four weeks afterwards? Um, this again, sounds like something that needs communication. Like that sounds like neither of you are kind of taking the step forward to resolve the issue. You're both holding back because, Well, I don't know why. There could be tons of reasons why, uh, but I don't want to guess at them. So if you want help with this, shoot me an email, j at uncoveringintimacy.com, and I can try to help you through this. Um, It's definitely something that's solvable, though. I think you might just need some help communicating and uh, coming up with ideas, but um, I need a little bit more information. So yeah, shoot me an email. All right. Our next question is from a husband. He writes, my wife of 50 plus years can usually orgasm only through manual stimulation and not that often, even though I'm willing to try to help her orgasm. She recently confided that when she's masturbating with my help, she has to fantasize that someone is watching in order to orgasm. Previously, I had introduced her to some anal play and for a while she would usually orgasm from that, but now she accepts anal play as okay and no longer dirty. So she's not able to come up come with just that any thoughts or suggestions um yeah we've got a few our support forum also had some questions so the first one was does she read erotica or romance novels you know because often they portray situations in which some sort of shame or force is being applied and if her brain has become accustomed to being aroused in that way that might be the cause so she might want to stop that so that her brain can readjust to kind of healthy sexuality Uh, The second was, what was she taught about sex growing up? If she was taught that sex is dirty or shameful, then she could associate sex with dirty feelings, and then she can't get aroused until she feels that sense of guilt or shame or dirtiness. And the third question that the group had was, has she experienced some sort of abuse as a child? And this also sometimes happens that people who were sexually assaulted as a child form neural pathways that connect sex to shame, dirtiness, or some other feeling that was there at the time. Um, But she still has the physical ability to orgasm, so that's good. Uh, It's just something in her brain seems to be getting in the way. And it could be a sense of taboo boosts her sexual excitation system enough to outweigh her sexual inhibition system uh, to let her have an orgasm. I can link to a post on the dual control model that kind of explains those two systems. Uh, The two options here generally uh, when dealing with that are 
first to figure out what's holding her back. So what's triggering her sexual inhibition system? This is kind of like the the brakes if your sex drive is a car. And this could be past abuse or a mindset or just um you know dirty dishes in the sink kind of thing. You know something's holding her back and making it harder for her to become aroused. Um uh, the other th- option is to find something else that boosts her sexual excitation system. So uh whereas the first one's kind of figuring out what's hitting the brakes, the other one is trying to figure out what hits the gas harder. And the problem with that one is, as you say, it wears off. Um, You tried it with anal play and for a while that worked, um, but now it's not exciting anymore. You know, it's kind of like if something's holding her back, if if there's something holding the breakdown, it doesn't matter how much gas you give it. uh, Eventually, you're not going to get far. So, and you might be constantly looking for something new to kind of trigger that dopamine rush, that that sense of excitement that allows her to orgasm. So, while that second option can be useful, sometimes in the long term, uh, the long term goal should be the first one to figure out what's holding her back, and that might take some introspection. You know, reading the right book, going to therapy, uh, getting some coaching, figuring out what is causing that shift in mindset. Uh, and my wife had a couple ideas too. She said, well, you know, what about taking videos of yourself? You know, you don't need to watch them, but maybe knowing it's recorded could get her excited. You know, the fact that she needs to feel that dirty feeling has, I had my wife thinking that there might be some teachings from when she's young that's holding her back. Uh, like I said, and lastly, my wife thought, you know, maybe she's a bit of a rebel or an adren- adrenaline junkie. You know, maybe she's just trying to keep her sex life exciting. And as with the question before, it could be, yeah, she's kind of bored or disengaging or she's uh, in her head too much. And you can try things like dirty talking, uh, uh, telling her a story about you to having sex to help her kind of re-engage, to keep her grounded, to keep her there and, uh, yeah, engaged and present. So there are some things to try. Uh, if not, you can, again, shoot me an email and we can try to help you work through these things. All right, our next question is about the book Boundaries. So this husband asks, I'm not sure how to address this. I'm not perfect, and I know this, but ever since my wife read the book Boundaries, our marriage took a nosedive. She calls them boundaries, but they feel like walls. We only have sex when she allows it. She makes me feel like a sex fiend if I ask, and always says that I'm addicted to sex because I ask for it weekly. I was reading another pastor's review, and he didn't like the book because it approaches the reader assuming that they are the victim. And I'd agree. My wife treats me like I'm sexually abusive for wanting sex. I'm not even allowed to see her naked or I'm a perv. She keeps adding new boundaries and pushing me further. When I tell her this, she says the book told her I'd act this way, and it confirms it. I love her, but she is crushing me. She claims to be a Christian, but I'm not so sure anymore since she read this book. So, unfortunately, this is something that happens fairly regularly when people read the book Boundaries. And for those who don't know, the book Boundaries is is a book about boundaries. And it's actually designed to teach you how to have healthy boundaries in your life, in your marriage. And uh, there are a few different flavors of the book. Uh, one's for marriages, one's for kids, one's for... Uh, I think there might be one for work, I'm not sure. Anyways... And it's a good book if you approach it with the right mindset, but it's also a dangerous book. You know, not that it's a bad book, it's just designed for a specific group of people. And for that group, it helps. But for another group, uh, it can do some serious damage. And sometimes people start adapting what they call boundaries, but are really nothing like the boundaries in the book. They don't come from a place of love, but rather from a place of fear or hate or a mix. Uh, and those false boundaries are usually designed to protect the individual from growing, whether they use it as a shield against conviction or against being vulnerable or intimate. And it becomes a way to isolate and validate their shutting down against their own convictions and ultimately leads to a hardened heart, which is a very dangerous thing. And unfortunately, the response to unhealthy boundaries by a healthy person is going to look a little similar to the response to healthy boundaries by an unhealthy person. You know, they're going to get frustrated and hurt and possibly a little angry. And that's why usually when I have 
someone who needs to assert some real healthy boundaries, I suggest a different book instead first. Uh, There's a book called Keep Your Love On by Danny Silk, and it teaches about boundaries, but within the context of a larger message about how to love unconditionally yourself and others. And because it's focused on love rather than protection, I find it lays a better groundwork for what a healthy boundary is. The book Boundaries tries, but often people miss the message and jump straight to setting up boundaries that make them feel protected. And some people, frankly, need to feel less protected. Vulnerability is a key part of both growth and intimacy. As for whether or not she's a Christian, I can't answer that. What I can say is that sometimes Christian people act very unchristian like but it's also true uh, that the status of our heart is kind of told by our actions. So I'd suggest reading the book, Keep Your Love On, and then maybe suggest it to your wife. Say that you think she'll like it because she enjoys boundaries so much. Uh, Then model what healthy boundaries are while showing her unconditional love. Show her what love looks like, not by being angry or sulking or attacking her new quote-unquote protection, but by sliding past it. And yes, there is a risk that she'll see that you're being more loving and think, look, it's working and double down. But there's also a chance that by being loving, you'll convict her uh, strongly enough that you'll break through this defense. You know, And this makes me think of a verse in Proverbs uh, 25 verses 21 to 22. You know, If your enemy is hungry, give them bread to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. If we're so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. In short, the way to respond by somebody treating us unkindly is not to get upset and treat them unkindly back, but to kind of re-up our love, you know, find ways to love them even more. Because usually when people act like this, it's because they're hurting. Something is going on with her, whether she's um, feeling convicted about something or she has some old wounds that haven't healed. Something is going on with her that is making her latch on to something unhealthy in order to feel protected. Um, so show her love. So show her what real love is like. All right, our next question is about vibrators. So this person writes, Hi Jay, I frequently use a a vibrator to reach orgasm and it takes a very long time to reach one using manual stimulation. Using a vibrator, I can usually reach an orgasm within one to two minutes, but there's but are there any long-term effects to using a vibrator to get an orgasm so fast? I've done a little bit of research, and some will say that eventually your body will need a stronger and more intense vibration to achieve one, and the intensity of orgasms won't be nearly as strong slash long. So, yes, there are some long-term effects, but not permanent ones. You know, Our brains are very plastic, that is to say malleable, so that it's possible to rewire a lot of things. And yes, some people say that they need stronger vibrations, but uh, I believe only if they're using it very, you know, quote unquote, hard. Uh, Like if they're pushing the vibrator right against their clitoris uh, with a fair amount of pressure. So it depends on how you use it. If you prefer a lighter touch, then it's not likely to be as much of an issue. It's sort of the equivalent to, you know, death grip, as they call it, for men who masturbate and now can't get used to the softer feel of a vagina and they can't orgasm during sex. Uh, The problem with vibrators is that you get used to being able to orgasm in one to two minutes, and that's incredibly efficient. (laughs) So then when you want to orgasm without a vibrator, it seems to take forever. And studies say that most women achieve orgasm in 20 to 40 minutes of direct manual stimulation. Uh, Of course, many women would rather take the 1.5 minutes instead of 30 uh, if we take the averages of those, Uh, especially if sex isn't higher on the priority list and it makes it end quicker. But with more practice at manual stimulation, you know, anecdotal evidence suggests that the 20 to 40 minutes can be shortened considerably. You know, we did a survey back in 2018, which I'll link to, uh, on this, and amongst our married Christian couples, the average time to orgasm is down to about 15 minutes, with about half of them being shorter than that. And I think as couples learn to have sex together, they get better at it. Um, they get more efficient, more relaxed, and the orgasms come easier. And the other problem is that efficiency shouldn't always be the goal. Sure, you can orgasm in one to two minutes. 
And if your husband is similarly efficient and is orgasming in, let's say, under five minutes, that means that your intimate time together is pretty short. Now, sometimes that's handy if you're trying to slip in a quickie before work or church or whatever. But in my personal opinion, sometimes those longer protected sex sessions where you get a chance to serve each other for prolonged periods, those are really more intimacy building. Knowing that husband that your husband will pleasure you for 20 to 40 minutes because you're worth it and because he likes to be involved because uh, he wants to know that he can give you that pleasure, that can be a powerful way to show and receive love. Uh, if you can get out of your head with worrying about how long it's taking then that can be a really special thing. Plus, the more you practice at it, the easier it will likely come. And then you can use tricks like edging and changing activities to prolong the intimacy. So while I don't think that there's anything wrong with using a vibrator, I'd still practice those times when you don't. Also, those times when a husband can make his wife orgasm without a vibrator, that's a huge ego boost to them. Uh, The sense of accomplishment is pretty amazing. Um, Just to know that it's still possible sometimes is not a bad thing to have. It doesn't have to be every time for most husbands, but once in a while, it's well worth the time invested. Um, If you're looking for times that are more likely to be easier, uh, I would try around uh, the time that you ovulate, which requires you knowing how your cycles work a little bit. Um, The other thing that you can try is if you haven't had sex in a while, like right after your period. Uh, I think that's it for now. Yeah. So I have more questions coming up uh, as soon as I get February's and March's written. Uh, I'm also working on a virtual marriage retreat while everyone is stuck at his home. So if you haven't already, you might want to subscribe to our newsletter to get updated. There is a link in the show notes for that as well. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing them in some kind of webinar format. And I may or may not uh, open up kind of a forum with like weekly activities and homework and stuff too, uh, because I figured while well, everyone's kind of stuck at home and not doing a whole lot, you might as well work on your marriage. I mean, after all, you, you guys probably around each other way more than usual. And for some couples that causes a lot more conflict. So we might as well learn how to handle that appropriately. As always, you can email me at j at uncoveringintimacy.com. You can ask your own questions on our anonymous have your question page. And if you want access to our forum where you get to see all the discussions about these kind of questions and uh, share and be part of a community that isn't scared to talk about really challenging and uh, taboo questions that uh, you usually don't get to tackle, uh, check out our support page. That's it for now. See ya.